Let me tell you about TJ. Um, on his 20, he was a healthy engineer who really loved to race cars. He, he really liked the speed. And then he had a terrible accident. Um, his car flipped over, and in less than a second, his arm was amputated at the elbow joint. It was gone. Then, soon after he recovered, he started to feel suddenly the presence of his missing arm, which is actually a rather common sensation. People or women who have had a mastectomy, they will still feel the presence of their missing breast, as will do people who lose an ear or nose. So although this part of the body has been physically detached from it, and from all the connections to the brain, the presence often remains. Now, a phantom sensation by itself is not a problem. The problem is that often the perception of the joints can feel in an anatomically impossible position. So fingers pull all the way back, or a fist close so strongly that it will feel the nails are going through the skin. A very painful and stressful position, which is actually how TJ felt his hand permanently. So, burning, cutting, cramping are also some of the sensations that are reported in these phantom limbs, uh, hence the name phantom limb pain. And on top of all the difficulties that a patient has to face after an amputation, such as reduced mobility when you don't have a leg, or things as mundane as dressing yourself when you're missing one hand or two hands, on top of all those functional problems in activities of the daily living, they often develop this phantom limb pain. Now, there is a lot of um, stigma around this situation, and that's because it's not fully understood. If I show you a picture like this, if you haven't noticed, there is uh, likely to be a fracture in progress. Um, I broke my ankle twice playing this sport, so I know it hurts. But even if you never broke a bone, you can imagine how painful that is. You can look at the face of the guy in the background. So you, you intuitively, you know it hurts. Now, if I show you these pictures, you don't get exactly the same reaction, right? Particularly not from the, the middle one from the previous um, <laughs> World Cup. Uh, that one tends to elicit other kind of feelings in Mexicans. But, you know, even if you're not Mexican, you know there is no pain there. It's not, it's not real. So, phantom limb pain is not really like this kind of pain. It's very real, it's rather common, it can be very hard to treat, and therefore it becomes chronic. The studies have shown that chronic pain impairs cognitive functions, working memory, sleep. It can cause depression. It basically hinders quality of life. Um, people who had uh, phantom limb, um, chronic pain, they mostly get affected by themselves also, but their families and their close relatives. And the society as a whole, of course, because there are a lot of costs associated with this kind of disabilities. Now, surgical and pharmacological approaches provide mostly limited pain relief with considerably side effects. And interestingly, one of the most effective solutions today is a concept where you trick the brain by placing a mirror in the still available limb. So if I lose one hand, I put a mirror in the other hand, and then I move them both simultaneously. This is very simple and cheap solution that has been shown rather effective in controlled clinical trials, but yet there's still a lot of patients who have tried um, and had no improvement. And unfortunately, TJ was one of those. So when I met TJ, he had suffered around 48 years from phantom limb pain, more than half of his life. He was effectively living in a constant state of pain. If you measure pain between zero to 10, zero no pain, and 10, and 10 the worst possible pain, he will always have anything between three and four. But during the day, he will have often periods where he will go up to the 10 level. And during the night, these periods of um, intense pain will wake him up, and therefore he couldn't sleep properly. Um, so as you can imagine, after so many years in pain, he had tried everything to get rid of it. Mirror therapy, painkillers, acupuncture, self-hypnosis, um, you name it. And unfortunately, again, with not um, positive results. So I got to know him because at the time, I was testing a technology for the control of bionic arms. In my group, we developed the first artificial arm connected directly to the bone, nerves, and muscles. Along with all the necessary technology for a precise neural control, which also allows the patient to feel with the robotic hand. Now, my work in this field is part of another talk, but something we learn is that when you produce an artificial limb replacement that is um, functional and well accepted by the patient, 
that's probably the best solution. However, a lot of these patients, they're not willing or are able to go through more surgeries to have such a system. Um, a lot of these patients, they're rather senior, they could still have a very happy life if they can get rid of pain. At 72 years old, uh, TJ, he already lived to learn his life with a rather simple prosthesis. Pain was his major problem, not, not really the not having an arm. So what we said is like, okay, we can mix the non-invasive part of this technology, and what we will do is we will place electrodes around the stump to pick up patterns of muscular activity. We use a conventional webcam and a um, monitor, and that works basically like a mirror, but then we add a marker. And with that marker, we know where in the arm uh, where in the image the arm should be. So we augment reality by adding a virtual arm, and the most important part here is that he can control that arm in the same way that he will control his biological arm. So we decode the synergistic activation of the muscles using machine learning algorithms to be able to predict motor volition in real time. In other words, we know what his phantom hand wants to do, and we tell the virtual limb to do it. So this was very... Um, Thrilling for TJ, and he really enjoyed it, but I soon realized that just moving the hand around without a purpose wasn't that fun. So what we said is, okay, we can take the motor output and hook it up to, to other things. And in this case, we, we connect them to a game. So the way he's controlling or he's racing that car is by doing phantom movements. When he turns his, his wrist to the right, the car goes right. When he turns his wrist to the left, it goes left. He's accelerating by flexing the elbow and breaking by extending it. And of course, you can't see any of that because there is no arm to see, but the way he's actually driving that car is using the, the phantom limb. Um, and the next thing that we say, okay, we want to be sure that it's not only random movements you know, happen, happening because. So we, we use this setup in virtual reality where we show a target posture, the green hand, and then TJ is controlling the virtual hand to match that um, posture. This test was originally developed at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, and we normally use it to evaluate how good our algorithms are at predicting uh, motor volition. But in this case, instead of using it as an evaluation tool, we use it as a rehabilitation tool because it challenges the patient to produce precise movements with their missing hand. So when I, when I met TJ, we, we say, OK, we can meet once per week, and we'll see how this, how this works out. Uh, after a few sessions, he started to feel a little bit better. He could relax the hand until one day we were in the middle of a session when um, I noticed he had tears in his eyes. So I, so I got super worried, and then a lot of things were running through my head, and I was thinking about how uh, visual feedback is playing up in the brain and how motor activity might be modifying the pain circuitry and how somehow things went wrong, and now he's having more pain, and we were trying to help, and things got worse. So I immediately stopped the session. I asked him, you know, what, what's going on? How, how can I help you? Um, when he looked at me and said, I live so long in pain that I forgot how it felt not having it. So we just look at each other into the eyes and, and smile and didn't really say much, just, just let the moment be. For the first time in 48 years, he was experiencing the pleasure of not having pain. Um, and those tears were of happiness. So. If all the work done so far will have been just to help you know, him, one patient, uh, it will have worth it. I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's why I got into this business in the first place. But now that we discover a potential treatment, it became rather a, a moral obligation to try to bring it to others. Um, so the first thing we did was publish it in a scientific journal. The article got noticed by the scientific community and the media, and that helped me to get in touch with other clinicians who were frustrated because they couldn't help patients like TJ. So we partner up uh, and we start a multi-center clinical trial only in these difficult cases. So we were treating only patients that had chronic phantom limb pain and nothing else had worked before. We had little, um, a little bit of funding, so, so not that much. So the clinicians had to put their own time um, and they did it because they wanted to see their patients get better. And I was also lucky enough that I could find a group of engineers that get on board and we could manage to build few systems uh, that can be used in the hospitals. And it all worked the effort because we were very happy to find similar results. So some patients got a little bit um, better than others, but in average, we found um, significant decrease in pain, but also 
in the intrusion of pain in activities of the daily living and sleep. So why does this work at all? Um, why playing games and, and looking at this image will do any difference? So to start with, we don't know exactly how phantom limb pain happens in the first place. It is likely to begin with peripheral nociceptors sending information on tissue damage up to the brain and brain changes itself. Um, and once healing has taken place, it's most likely that these changes in the central nervous system are the responsible for maintaining the pain experience. So we have in our brain, in our cortex, dedicated areas to process sensor information from all parts of our body. When a limb is lost, the neurons in that area, they're required to do something else. There's a cortical re, um, reorganization, a functional reorganization of the neurons um, in the cortex. So research done by Professor Flohr and her team in Germany have shown that there is a high correlation between the degree of cortical reorganization and phantom limb pain. And cortical reorganization is often explained by sensory deprivation. So there's no more, you don't have a hand, there's nothing coming up to your brain but the motor cortex is equally affected. Um, because you're not producing movements, why would someone utilize their brain to do a movement in a hand that is no longer there? There is no purpose. And since there is no purpose, there is no use. So on top of the cortical changes, there are also function functional connections between different areas of the brain that stop being used and start doing something else. And all these changes, which happen rather fast, somehow entangled with the pain neuromatrix and the perception of pain uh, takes over. So, what we now know is that um, the technology I show you, it encourages the patients to utilize all central and peripheral circuitry to do movements again. And in that way, we're trying to normalize the cortical maps and all functional relations in, in the brain. And, and at least that's my working hypothesis. Um, but we, it's not only the motor function that is involved here. There's also sensory and attentional components because they're very focused on their task. So it's an entertaining, challenging, and engaging task. Uh, and therefore, patients can spend a lot more time in the rehab, whether they will just spend you know, a few minutes in front of a mirror. And for that reason, this tool is rather attractive for neuromuscular rehabilitation in general, when you would like to increase neural drive to improve uh, motor function, as in the case when you're trying to recover from stroke or nerve injuries. And at the, at the end of the day, pain is a, it's a very complex sensory and emotional experience. It's an important part of life, and it's a necessary for, part of life for, for survival. You, you need pain to keep yourself from harming your body. It's an alarm system. The problem is that when the switch of the alarm is broken, and then you can't turn it off, as in the case of neuropathic pain, then it can really suck the life out of patients. Uh, we developed this technology with the hope that it will help patients and researchers to fight pain. And we made most of it open source so it can be used where, wherever it's needed. So what I will say is, if you have this kind of pain, uh, don't be afraid to speak out and reach for help. There's a lot of people with the condition. And if you don't think this pain is real just because you can get your head around it, uh, you should still be respectful of people trying to overcome it. Because if you have a brain, it can equally happen to you. Thank you.